Hello everyone and welcome to Biohackers Lab. I'm your host, Gary Kerwin, and on today's episode I have Lily Nichols. Lily is a registered dietitian and nutritionist. She's a certified diabetes educator and even a certified Pilates instructor who has written the book Real Food for Gestational Diabetes and she's got her new book that's just been released called Real Food for Pregnancy. Thanks so much for coming on, Lily. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I like it um, that you're a dietitian, a registered dietitian, and you're pro low carb or real food. And that's it right now. It seems that seem that seems to be a real hot topic in the dietetics world. If dietitians should be adopting low carb or not, and yeah, there's there's a lot of fights. You always see it on Twitter. Um, how does it feel being a, a low carb dietitian? Do you get any sort of um, backlash or issues? Uh... Yeah, yes, of course. Um, I honestly think one of the biggest things in the nutrition world, especially in like con- coming from like conventional dietetics, is the whole issue around fat and saturated fat. Because, you know, pretty much all of us are training as RDs, we have to go through, you know, government guideline nutrition education right yeah. it's up to us whether we want to research outside the box some of us have professors who were more willing to discuss you know current research but at the end of the day we're all trained on government guidelines which is 45 to 65 percent of the calories coming from carbohydrates which is a lot um plus you have that you know super old misinformation about saturated fat where, you know, by default, if you go lower carb, a larger proportion of your calories have to come from fat. And by default, some of that is going to come from saturated fat. Now, I, I don't think saturated fat is an issue. I think it's been, you know, cleared if it's, you know, artery clogging nicknames and whatnot. But um, that holds a lot of dietitians back, I think, from embracing low carb, because they can't imagine how a diet that's so high in meat and so high in fat um, could be a problem. And then there's also a lot of misconceptions. I mean, I say so high in meat, but like, you know, they, they, their view of what's so high in meat by, might be having animal protein, you know, at every meal or two meals a day. That might seem really, really high. Um, or they might be even uncomfortable with the idea of, you know, full fat dairy products. Again, it's just a lot of it comes back to misinformation that we were given on saturated fat, unfortunately. And, how willing you are to research beyond that. <laughs> and I think it's important because th- this is going to lead into our talk w- about prenatal care and pregnant mums and even aftercare um, and just the importance of healthy fats um, for mums yes. and, and fetus. So it's I, I would hope that uh, that's why your book is so amazing where it, you would hope that mums who are growing a newborn child that they do get a good in-source of healthy fats, both for them and their and their growing fetus. So, um, right, yeah. So, I think if we could, then I'm going to start off. I, I've I've mentioned you're a dietitian, but um, your your book title mentions real food, and I, I have had um a, um a orthopedic surgeon on here called Dr. Gary Fetke from Australia, and he also talks about real food. But if you don't mind, what what's your what what do you mean about real food? mom's listening yeah so there's a bunch of different ways to define it for me um just to differentiate real food from again like sort of conventional nutrition guidelines for me real food is i'm a diet that focuses mostly on unprocessed foods so a lot of you know conventional nutrition stuff there you're you're trying to get fortified foods in there because they're worried about calcium. So you have your calcium fortified orange juice and they're worried about the iron. So you have your iron fortified cereal and then they're worried about it's all these things that are fortified. Whereas if you start to sort of, you know, I call it like reverse engineer where you're going to get your nutrients, where you end up with is you can pretty much meet all your nutrient needs or most of your nutrient needs from real food, as long as it's an omnivorous diet. So for me, real food means um, unprocessed foods, simple ingredients, um, mainly coming from a paleo-ish, primal-ish template. So like meats, fish, um, eggs, if dairy works for your body, dairy, if legumes work for you, okay. Um, Nuts and seeds and did I mention vegetables and probably some fruit in there too. Like that's what I see as 
as real food. It's unprocessed, um, but it comes from a wide variety of, of sources. Yeah, and what I like about it is it's just simple. It's actually how food grows. So that's the good stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have to come in packaging and wrapping and cans and be added to. Or, yeah, it's just real. Exactly. Uh, so um, if we could start with, um, what are some of the issues that you think are uh, what, what are some of the issues in the current sort of pregnancy guidelines out there from a, from a, what guidelines are telling pregnant mums to eat? The biggest issue that I see with the prenatal guidelines is an sort of imbalance in the ratio of, of macronutrients. So it tends to be um, a little lower on, lo- on the lower end of protein. So for example, I looked at um, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is the new name for the uh, American Dietetic Association, they have like a, a guide for optimal pregnancy. It's like a practice policy guideline. They have a sample meal plan in there. And the sample meal plan has for breakfast oatmeal, low-fat milk, and strawberries. That is their suggested breakfast for pregnant women, which is very low in fat and very low in protein. I mean, most it's mostly carbs. It's just mostly carbs. It's not that's I would feel awful if I was eating that for breakfast. I'd be starving in like 30 minutes or maybe an hour. So um, when you start to sort of break down, you know, where their where their nutrients are coming from, because they're so heavy on carbs, you end up with a diet that's pretty low in fat. And that's on purpose because they believe that fat is harmful. And it's also not very high in protein because most of your real food protein sources come with fat. And so in an effort to keep the fat below a certain threshold, your sources of protein, especially animal protein, are, are kept pretty limited. So that's the biggest issue is the carbohydrate. Um, carbohydrates are way too high. Protein is way too low um, or a little bit too low. And fat is way too low. So it, for me, it's a it's like reversing <laughs> like tipping it up on its head. Like I like to keep the carbohydrates much lower um, from my work with, especially with gestational di- diabetes, which is, you know, high blood sugar that is either, either develops or is first recognized during pregnancy. You have to keep the carbs on the lower end to control the blood sugar levels because carbohydrates are the main macronutrient that raises blood sugar. And so by default, when you lower the carbohydrates, the fat percentage goes up a little bit. And I actually believe and show um, in this latest book that I'm working on that it's actually better for us and we get, you know, a better um, uh, diet quality, like higher levels of micronutrients when our diet is focused more on these, again, real food sources that are giving us plenty of protein and fat and a lesser amount of carbohydrates. Yeah. Yeah. And as you mentioned to that breakfast dish, for me, that's like a hangry dish. You're going to get hungry and exactly. angry <laughs> pretty fast. That's yeah. like the opposite of a breakfast that I would recommend for people. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so you're immediately, uh, this is just a personal thing. I, I don't like low fat milk or semi skim milk. Um, I think just drink real milk, like um, full fat milk. There's no problems with that. Exactly. Yeah. And um, that's what I'm thinking when I see like low fat, semi skimmed on oats, Oh, I just think, oh no, you just, what is in there? There's hardly anything. It's like having oats with water. So, yeah, there's not much flavor in there. And that doesn't, I mean, carbohydrates digest so quickly that you get that initial, like, sort of bulk feeling in, in your gut from having so many oats. But then by the time it digests, you're, you just went through this huge blood sugar swing and you are exactly what you say, hangry. Mm-hmm. Just, yeah. Not and happy. then what do you crave? You crave something that's going to make your blood sugar go back up. Yeah. But don't worry, their meal plan has plenty of carbs in it. So you'll just get your blood sugar right back up there in the next two hours when you have your snack. Well, we're going yeah. to be talking about gestational diabetes and that issue um, in a little bit. But what I'd like to move on to next then is um, the avoidance issue. So a lot of pregnant women are told to avoid certain foods. But to me, when I was reading the list of foods that women need to avoid, they seem so nutritious. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Which specific foods on the foods to avoid list? Well, I've, it's like livers one, because liver's like a, a power sort of organ meat. Um, yeah. And then I've also, I've always been interested, I know the raw fish issue, but then I've always thought about women in Japan who probably still eat sushi. And so 
yes. th- these guidelines, do they ever consider sort of cultural elements and see like, well, you've got people who eat in this part of the world who have like no issues. So what what are we, are we sort of scaremongering a little bit there? Because I, I mean, yeah, there'll be I some actually, risk, but yeah. I have a whole um, section on this in the book because I think it's such a big issue. So a lot of the foods that women are told to avoid are for, you know, food safety reasons. So um, the risk of, of food poisoning, basically. And your immune system is different during pregnancy. It's slightly depressed because it doesn't want your body to reject this foreign entity in your body. This growing baby is different from you. It's not yourself. And so you don't want your immune system to overreact react, and then cause you know, a miscarriage. So the immune system is by design different. Mm -hmm. And that does um, slightly increase the susceptibility to certain foodborne illnesses and certain foodborne illnesses can cause things like miscarriage or cause issues, um, especially like listeria. Um, What's interesting is when you start to actually look at the research at the prevalence of listeria and salmonella and all these infections and how common they are in the foods that pregnant women are told to avoid, you see a huge discrepancy. Um, And when you look, there was actually a study that looked at um, specifically women who stuck very, very strictly to the listeria uh, foods to avoid lists. So that includes like um, soft cheese, deli meats, unless they've been heated, um, you know, smoked fish, unless it's been heated um, raw eggs, uh, I'm trying to remember all of them, raw milk. Uh, so women who stuck very strictly to those food restrictions, they actually were more likely to be nutrient deficient themselves. And the researchers came to the conclusion that it's better to be like moderately cautious, like to have some of those foods than to not have some of those foods. They didn't use those exact words, but that's essentially what they were saying um, was that when you strictly avoid some of these things, you get lower intakes of nutrients. And I see that on my end um, as well with, with pregnant, working with pregnant women too, they get so worried about the food safety stuff. And then the majority of the food safety guidelines suggest avoiding animal foods. Mm. And if that's some of the few animal foods that you're actually eating, then you end up with a diet that's actually kind of nutrient deficient. And What's ironic is that when you look at what what's the most likely cause of food poisoning, it's actually fresh produce, fruits and vegetables, mostly raw fruits and vegetables, especially those prepared outside the home. But nobody tells a pregnant woman to avoid eating a salad. They're all gung-ho on green salad, but that's more likely to put them in the hospital than having some salami. So it's, you know, it ends up being kind of a numbers game, honestly. And so I don't personally subscribe to the foods to avoid list. Um, other than just common food safety precautions and doing things to, to, you know, improve your immunity and improve your gut health. So you aren't as susceptible to getting, um, food poisoning in the first place. And to touch upon your, um, question on the sushi thing, the raw fish thing. Yeah. In, in Japan, it actually is permissible to have raw fish, um, during pregnancy and it's encouraged. Because it's actually a really good source of a lot of nutrients. And I know that I've observed both of myself when I was pregnant and some of my clients that um, raw fish was more tolerable. Like I remember having a huge aversion to cooked fish for quite a bit, for quite a big part of my pregnancy. Now, granted, at the time I was living in Alaska, so I had access to like really good fresh seafood. So I wasn't too concerned, but I could eat ceviche. I'd make salmon ceviche. And I was like, good to go. I'm like, I know I'm taking a risk here, but this is delicious. And I can devour, you know, six ounces of this in a sitting. But like the thought of cooking fish or eating cooked fish was like extremely repulsive to me. Now I wouldn't recommend eating like sushi that you pick up at a gas station or something where you don't know how long it's sitting around Mm. and where the fish is from, whatever. But if you know your sources of fish, you know that it's clean, it's prepared hygienically, it's eaten right away at, you know, then you're good to go. And even the, um, the British national health service suggests that it's okay for pregnant women to eat sushi because most of the time, uh, sushi grade fish has been frozen for a while before it's prepared And so that um, actually reduces the risk of parasites and some of these other contaminants. So I thought it was interesting how in the U.S. we're like super, super scared. But then you go to the U.K. and they seem to say that it's fine. So it's like there's always discrepancies on the official guidelines. Yeah, And I like to always think of that. So when you get told of a guideline, just 
where that country is, but then look at other countries and think, okay, so if it was a deadly killer, how many sort of aborted fetuses are happening or like mums are dying? It's And then you start looking at like absolute risk. And as you said, it just becomes a numbers game in stats. But I thought, yeah, it'd be interesting for some pregnant yeah. mums who become very fearful of certain foods, I think. When you they- know, let me pull up some stats actually, because there is a couple interesting ones that I um, quote in my book. So the risk, so using data from the US FDA, so the estimated risk of um, listeria infection was one case per 83,000 servings of deli meat or five, one case per 5 million servings of soft cheese consumed by pregnant women. 5 it's million. Just, yeah. <laughs> wow. And then the likelihood that an egg would contain salmonella is like 1 in 30,000. And then that is seven times lower if you purchase pasture-raised eggs because the chickens are healthier themselves and don't harbor as much pathogenic bacteria. So it's just lower. It's just a lot lower. The risk is very, very low. And so I think you just have to take like common sense. You know, if you aren't sure the eggs you're getting are great quality, then sure, cook them until the yolks are solid. If you're getting really good pasture-raised eggs, I don't see any problem with doing them over easy. Mm. So yeah, you just have to kind of make a call in the risk benefit equation in your head and decide what you're most comfortable with. Yeah, I like that. Always use common sense. <laughs> and hopefully it's it's working well. Um so but the we talked a little bit about the hangry factor. Do you think then when women adopt a more real food type of eating, do they feel less hungry um, because they feel more satiated? Like you were talking even in your situation. Yes, often that's exactly what happens. So especially if you get breakfast right, this is even not even just pregnant women. This is like everybody. You get <laughs> breakfast right, you get enough protein and fat first thing in the gate. And you know, some people's carb tolerance is variable. So some people do well with carbs in the morning. Some people do well with very, very little. But as long as you get a big hefty protein, serving of protein and fat in the morning, you start your blood sugar off on a very stable level and you're less likely to see those big swings. And for me, the most common thing that I see is food cravings that were triggered actually by blood sugar swings that weren't well managed because breakfast was a mess. And then the mid morning snack was a mess. And then lunch was a mess. And it just kind of continues for the rest of the day. So yeah, a lot of it has to do with with um, blood sugar, in my opinion. Okay. And then also breakfast, I mean, I think that the world's going to be interesting nowadays because intermittent fasting has become very popular too. I know you you, yes. you don't talk about that in the in the book. I don't think you don't. I do not talk about no. intermittent fasting. Sorry, but I, this is going to you just got me thinking. This is, this happens when I yeah, do yeah. these interviews, and I'm just wondering, like, women who've been practicing intermittent fasting who become pregnant, I'm guessing in that situation they shouldn't be into maybe they shouldn't be intermittent fasting. Um, do you think they should be? having a breakfast to start the day like within the first hour of waking waking my opinion is yes you should eat more consistently during pregnancy if you are somebody who is regularly doing fasting before and that's not necessarily to say it's like the you know the actual like intermittent fasting as a practice that's a problem it's more that your nutrient needs are so much higher Mm. um and a lot of times, depending on what stage you are in pregnancy, you know, in, in early pregnancy, when you're more likely to have nausea and food aversions, it's about just getting in a little bit of something whenever you can, just to like settle your system. <laughs> in later pregnancy, you're, the baby is pushing up so much on your stomach that it's sometimes hard to eat a large quantity of food at one time. So for some people who do intermittent fasting, they can do, you know, one or two pretty large meals and do great, right? Um, That sustains them for the rest of the day. In pregnancy, late pregnancy and very early pregnancy, you probably just aren't going to be able to eat a huge quantity of food at one time. So even if women want to do it, I've noticed that they're often just not able. And so you just have to take a bit more of a, a mindful approach to like what sustains your energy levels the best, what keeps your stomach feeling well, when are you able to keep food down, what are your nausea triggers or heartburn or whatever. And oftentimes that just naturally ends up being eating on a more regular basis um, and possibly in smaller quantities or, or possibly not. I don't think there's any hard and fast rules on 
you have to have, you know, three square meals a day and three snacks. Like that has to be that way. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but I think eating more than twice a day is just naturally going to happen because of the signals your body sends you when you're pregnant. Yeah. Because it must be interesting for you. Um, I don't know if you've come across clients who are, come, like I mentioned, who are coming from a background of intermittent fasting or even a ketogenic diet or um, certain ways of eating. And when they are pregnant, you've sort of got to educate them too. Maybe they've got to change some of the the, eat, the cycles that they eat at. Because this is where I'm going here with this is um, – I think a lot of a lot of women won't like the weight gain that can happen during pregnancy. Um, so I'm just wondering here, is that something also that you address with? Yeah, and it depends on it depends on the woman. It, like if she's gonna gain weight or if she's not gonna gain weight or if that's good for her body or not yeah. good for her body. So people come to me at all different places in their pregnancy, and I've also worked with a really vastly different populations of pregnant women. I mean, I've worked in, you know, very low income area of Los Angeles with pregnant women who their intermittent fasting isn't part of their vocabulary. And then I've worked with, you know, other pregnant women who are super, super like hardcore, you know, paleo, maybe keto, maybe plays around with intermittent fasting. Um, and then a whole bunch of women with gestational diabetes who may be in either of these camps, right? So there's such a wide range of, of what I've seen with, with what pregnant women are eating. I think the tricky part is that I think a lot of pregnancy, a lot of it, you really just kind of have to surrender to what your body is telling you, mm -hmm. which is so hard when we just want to have it all buttoned up and have like everything under control. I mean, it's a great preparation for motherhood, by the way, but you know, even if you want to stay keto, um, and there are women who are able to do that their whole pregnancy, I have seen it. Um, but for a lot of women, I'd say definitely more than half of the women I see who try to start their pregnancy keto, they end up not being keto because of the food aversions and nausea, which are often aversions to meat and sometimes vegetables. <laughs> and then uh, the only foods that you can really get in sometimes when you're nauseous are the carbohydrates. Um, there's a lot of nuance to that discussion, but as you get like further in pregnancy, you know, a more lowish carb approach tends to work better. And some of that is related to, you know, the metabolic shifts that are happening in pregnancy. Um, you know, in, in early pregnancy, your body is in an anabolic state. It wants it wants the mom to put on maternal fat stores. And there's also a ton of stuff changing with like the vascular system, preparing for increased fluid volume. Um, you know, the cells in the fetus are, or I guess embryo at that point are, are replicating at like super fast pace. So you're just, I mean, you're growing a whole new person from scratch. So that is like a huge zap on your energy. Your pancreas is already starting to adapt to prepare for what's going to happen in later pregnancy. So in early pregnancy, your pancreas starts to get larger, you produce more beta cells, and you start producing more insulin in preparation for the insulin resistance that happens in late pregnancy. And so when you get, you know, closer to the halfway point, and we, they don't know exactly when it like shifts from anabolic to catabolic, but it's, I think it's more of a gradual process is you get in the second half of pregnancy, insulin resistance goes way up, your insulin production can up to triple. Um, but your body has already has like a, you have a buffer for those those higher insulin levels where in early pregnancy, insulin resistance actually drops in some women, like for women with type one diabetes, who, you know, they require insulin shots to manage their blood sugar, some of them see um, a drop in their insulin needs in sort of the middle of the first trimester and then they gradually start to go back up and then they tend to go up very, very high towards, you know, as you get further and further in the third trimester. Um, so some of this stuff is like your blood sugar naturally trends lower in pregnancy, especially in the first trimester, unless there's pre-existing insulin resistance going on. And then towards the end, when you have the insulin resistance going on from pregnancy and the, you know, insulin needs going up, you can actually do okay lower carb 
you generally don't have as much food aversions and nausea. It's just, it's like a whole different animal, <laughs> like one stage to the other stage. So a lot of it really is, does end up being like listening to your body and seeing what you can do. If you had to do more carbs in the first trimester, just to get through it, you really have to be mindful of like not getting, you know, addicted to the carbohydrates really, because if you, if you keep on keeping on being super, super high carb, especially refined processed carbohydrates, that's when you do see the weight gain go up quite a lot. Um, there's a, obviously a range in what weight gain is normal and, and, you know, kind of not so normal, but when you are getting towards the really way beyond the weight gain guidelines, the 25 to 35 pounds, and you're going like, you know, 30 pounds above that or more, in my experience, that's, that's food related, you know, that you do have some control over whether you're a person who gains 20 pounds or 35 pounds, you might not have as much control over that. But when you get to like the really, really higher and, you know, 80 pound weight gains during pregnancy, I mean, I see it in practice because I see women who have had, you know, multiple pregnancies before they have GD and then they get a gestational diabetes diagnosis and worry about their blood sugar we get their blood sugar managed and like they gained 20 pounds, <laughs> you know, it's like, Oh, I thought I was one of those people who always gained 80 pounds on my pregnancies. So it's like, no, no, you're, that wasn't just your body. Like a, a, a large portion of that was food related. So it's tricky. It gets me thinking then about the difference between a female who has a pregnancy earlier on in her age, say like her early twenties versus someone who's maybe in her mid 30s to late 30s and the weight the weight change that they'll experience there so maybe a part of this is the insulin resistance that um, someone earlier on doesn't have so much of the issue but add another 15 18 20 years to their life and they they're yes, dealing absolutely. with a different situation absolutely because they've found that a lot of gestational diabetes is really um more related to pre-existing undiagnosed prediabetes. So they came into pregnancy with insulin resistance. We're seeing a lot of that these days. Um, and gestational diabetes is more likely as you get older, again, because insulin resistance naturally changes. So, um, or tends to get worse. Now, for people who are sticking pretty low carb between their pregnancies, that that would ameliorate some of it. Or if you've maintained a healthy weight between pregnancies, that usually tends to help. But you know, on a on a large scale, take the whole U.S. and you start looking at the research studies on pregnant women. The tendency is that insulin resistance gets worse as you get older. You tend to start pregnancies at higher weights because maybe you didn't necessarily lose all the weight between pregnancies or whatever. Life gets in the way. Stress happens. The 30s are crazy, you know, <laughs> and, and you end up, um, yeah, starting the pregnancies with some of these, you know, pre-existing risk factors for, you know, more more weight on board and, and higher blood sugar. Okay. So um, with the gestational diabetes that we're talking about, so this is a, a problem of, of not being able to control your sugar levels during pregnancy for someone listening to understand what, what that means. But um, are, are you then, are you, if you get, I guess, to help clarify to some listeners, if they get gestational diabetes, does that mean they have diabetes for the rest of their, their lives? Not necessarily. So, it's a, it's a bit of a complicated answer. On one hand, gestational diabetes tends to be, um, you tend to just have the blood sugar problem during pregnancy. And about 90% of women, their blood sugar will go back down to normal postpartum. That said, that's when you're checking early postpartum and insulin sensitivity is like at an all time high because whether you choose to breastfeed or not, we're biologically programmed to make milk, which is a heavily relies heavily on readily available fuel such as glucose, right? So your body's way more insulin sensitivity sens sensitive um, in the immediate postpartum period and especially while breastfeeding. Over time, though, what we're finding is that uh, type 2 diabetes is more likely in women who had gestational diabetes during pregnancy. So it might not be an automatic thing where like, you had gestational diabetes and now like you're diabetic forever, there might be sort of like a lag time. Um, and gestational diabetes was more like the warning lights going on in your car, like, hey, we have kind of a problem here. You don't have to deal with it like right away, but like 
within 2000 miles, you better take your car in sort of situation. Um, and yeah, so the likelihood of type two diabetes, the stats range, but it can be up to 70%, um, in women who previously had GD, which is quite high. Mm. It's like, it is the best predictive factor we have of type two diabetes by far Wow, and, in women. And, and you have, you, I mean, your, your whole first book was about gestational diabetes. So if there's any moms who are listening right. to this, who want to learn more about that, that that's a resource for them that they could learn more how to manage it and even because i always think about yeah the the warning signs how they can tell themselves are they able to tell themselves that they that, that there's an issue it's, it's tricky with gestational diabetes you don't necessarily have you don't necessarily have symptoms of high blood sugar because the blood sugar isn't that high to be classified in the gestational diabetes range so blood sugar in pregnancy is super super interesting and there's a lot of misconceptions about what happens? People assume that blood sugar is naturally high in pregnancy. Like some people think gestational diabetes is a made up diagnosis. Um, it turns out that blood sugar trends about 20% lower in pregnancy in women who started their pregnancy as healthy and without diabetes. So like average fasting blood sugar can be as low as it's actually around 70. Um, but it can be in the range of like 60 to 90 in, in healthy pregnant women. And then post-meal blood sugar rarely goes above 120 in women without diabetes. So the blood sugar tends to want to stay below 100 most of the time. We can argue about what's truly normal blood sugar based on how you know we classify type 2 diabetes in adults. So it's you know kind of a separate discussion, but you know the body really tries hard to keep your blood sugar as low as it can because we know that high blood sugar can um, affect the development of the baby beyond a really high threshold. It can, it can cause, you know, very serious problems like birth defects and things, but now they're even finding that fairly low level, um, small elevations in blood sugar, I, I should say, can be a risk factor for things like, um, heart defects. If the high blood sugar is experienced in the first eight weeks of pregnancy when all the organs are forming. And we also know there can be little, um, epigenetic things that are like turned on or turned off, like the risk for type 2 diabetes and obesity um, in children is higher when the blood sugar levels trend higher. Okay. Um, and so the, the, um, with that, um, the, the one topic that you also talk about in there is about should you use the, the thought of eating for two? Because I can imagine, you know, mom gets pregnant and she notices like, oh, I'm starting to get really hungry. And then they just start uh, unfortunately, some it could be the quick carbs just to feel like uh, I'm feeling full. Um, but what 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 is your thoughts on the the concept of I have to eat for two? It's I think on one hand, if you're thinking of it from like my nutrient needs are a lot higher, then yeah, you're eating for two. Your well, almost all the nutrient needs go up, but a lot of the micronutrients like your vitamins and minerals go up. So from that perspective, yes, you're eating for two. Quantity wise, it's not like your calorie needs double, like they go up a little bit. But when they've looked at the studies on, you know, how much more the energy needs go up during pregnancy, it can be as little as 70 calories a day, which is like nothing. <laughs> a third of a snack, you know, it's like a few bites of food. It's not that much. Um, so for me, I like to have the, I'd rather the eating for two would be like, eat better quality food for two versus eating for two, meaning the amount. double the quantity, because yeah. you definitely don't need double the quantity. Um, and the calorie needs in pregnant, you know, it's, it's so funny I tend not to be super um one of those super nitpicky people on numbers because I swear to you there are like every pregnant woman will tell you this but there are times in pregnancy well you're you'll just be a bottomless pit for no apparent reason and then there'll be other times where you just barely graze in the day you're just not that hungry like it just varies so much I think the calorie needs are a lot more um you know, on, on a, on a spectrum or on like a sliding scale based on what's going on metabolically in your body at that time. We just, we don't have it all figured out as much as people think we have it figured out, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think 
if uh, anyone reads a physiology book and they have to look at the interactions of all these different systems, like who could ever understand like the, the human being is just incredible. So yeah. Yeah. And things are going to shift and change throughout, throughout time. Yes. Yeah. You got me thinking because we said about two, but now what about mums who end up having triplets and twins and because they're going to go, no, I've got to eat for four or I've got to eat for. <laughs> well, <laughs> How does that work? needs do go up more. They yeah. definitely need more um, for sure. Um, I'm just thinking because there's you know, all sorts with, of calculations for how to calculate that out. But it still is not double. Even if you're eating for twins, you're still if you're eating 2000 calories, you still don't need 4000 calories a day. It's like the human body has this very complex system you know i was talking about the you know anabolic and the catabolic phase mm -hmm. like during the second half of pregnancy your body is like rapidly mobilizing fat stores and shunting those nutrients to the baby that's also why the insulin resistance is higher because it's saying like maternal tissues don't need this nutrition don't absorb here go to the placenta like that's what it's telling your body to do um plus pregnant women also tend to for better for worse move less so if you're not as active as you were pre-pregnancy you also have some like energy savings because of that again like for the baby's protection in a mm. way mm. so yeah because uh, I'm, I'm just thinking also ivf is on the rise so there's, there's a, there tends to be actually a lot more twins it looks like just in society because of that too so yeah it got me thinking when you said uh, eating for two so um so we talked about a com the common issue of uh, sugar levels and gestational diabetes or pregnancy diabetes, but then hypertension or high blood pressure is also um, quite a common or uh, like thought of issue in pregnancy. And you talk about that in your book too, don't you? I do. Yeah. Yeah. The high blood pressure is really interesting. Um, what I have found most interesting, having worked like clinically with gestational diabetes. I used to work for a perinatologist in her office. So I did nutritional counseling for all the clients. We happen to have mostly gestational diabetes, but we'd also have, you know, they'd send women to see me if they were, their blood pressure was going high or even if they were, you know, full blown had preeclampsia and you take a diet recall on these women. This is not to say diet like causes some of these conditions because it doesn't necessarily, and sometimes it can't be prevented, but mm. What I observed sort of commonalities was a pretty high intake of refined carbohydrates. And we know that blood pressure and blood sugar tend to go hand in hand. So a lot of the information that I would give them for helping with their blood pressure would actually piggyback off a lot, a lot of the stuff that my ladies with gestational diabetes would get, which is like, you know, enough protein and fat, less carbohydrates and better quality carbohydrates. And a lot of times the blood pressure would come right down. And then there's some interesting research also um, looking at there's a variety of nutrient deficiencies that are linked to um, preeclampsia specifically. So, you know, this it's like the inability of the like endothelial cells to, you know, adapt to pregnancy, essentially. And um, you see a bunch of different nutrients that are that are involved in that process. So you see like vitamin D is related. You see electrolyte levels are related. You see choline and glycine are related. Um, and oftentimes when you get some of these things better managed, you get better intake of these nutrients, supplement with vitamin D on the electrolyte side of things. A lot of women are surprised to hear that more salt actually helps tends to lower blood blood pressure rather actually it does have an effect on blood sugar too but it tends to lower blood pressure and improve preeclampsia when they've been told the opposite they've been told to avoid salt mm. and then guess what happens when you avoid salt the food tastes awful and most of the low salt foods are have additional things to make it taste good like more sugar you just compound the issue cuz your your salt sensitivity gets super screwed up with lots of refined carbohydrates and fructose and whatnot. It just makes it all worse. But yeah, you start um, bringing in, you know, good quality sea salt, high antioxidant whole foods, enough protein, especially high glycine protein sources, enough choline. So giving them eggs, um, which helps with placental function, like 
a lot of it improves. Mm. Um, not all of it can be 100% managed with diet. Not all of it is necessarily caused by a dietary thing, but a lot of it can be better managed or improved by better quality nu- nutrient intake. Yeah, well, you know, I like that you brought up the salt because uh, I had um, a salt researcher, Dr. James Dina. Nick Lantonio, I don't know if you've read his book, yep. The Salt Fix. So, I have, yeah. yeah he, he, he blew the lid on the salt uh, stuff. On, that was great. But it's nice to hear also you've, you've seen the same thing where mums uh, have the salt aversion because they came in before they were pregnant, they were probably salt averse. And then they're further told, no, 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 don't have salt. But as you and said. What's yeah. ironic is their bodies tend to tell them to crave salt. Yeah. A lot of pregnant women crave salt. And it makes sense because you're your fluid volume goes up and all of our fluids in our body have salt in it. So, you know, that classic craving of like pickles and, you know, it it makes perfect sense. You have like the, you know, potassium in the pickle, you got the salt in the brine, it's sour. You have like full perfect electrolyte blend right there. And so these women who want like pickles and olives, I'm like, yeah, go for it. Like your body clearly wants it and has a need for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you got me thinking too with high blood pressure and how you said naturally the the, the real food, low carbohydrate diet that you would have given a mum anyway can also help them is maybe even there that the stress on their kidneys because they don't have these high glucose levels because high sugar levels stresses your kidney and your kidney influences your high your your blood pressure. So maybe there's something yeah. a little bit you know if you can just even control a little bit of that, it's it's probably a good thing. It's it's huge. And like the salt sensitivity that James lays out in his book, but I, you know, I also mentioned the research in mine, refined carbohydrates and fructose tend to drive up blood pressure. It's just it's just <laughs> what they do. So you take those things out and blood pressure improves. Yeah. Um, you also, you know, add in more salt and blood pressure tends to improve and swelling and edema that tends to go down as well which is opposite of what we've all been trained to to think um and it's actually kind of dangerous to go low salt even if you don't have any blood pressure problems in pregnancy they've shown that there can be like fetal restriction a growth restriction rather so the baby is not getting enough nutrients um You can have volume depletion. So it's like your body is not holding on to enough fluids because it's trying super hard to maintain electrolyte homeostasis. So you have like low amniotic fluid, um, higher risk of preterm birth. There's all sorts of problems of not eating enough salt. And so I I see that quite a bit. Plus like vegetables, I'm sure James mentioned this too. Vegetables don't taste good unless you have salt on them. Meat also doesn't really taste that good unless you have salt on it. Mm -hmm. But like refined carbs, those always taste good. (laughs) So, you know, when you're dealing with aversions, it's like you really have to go that extra mile to make some of these healthy foods taste really good. And and salt and fat is a big part of the equation. So you're saying salted caramel could be good for me in one way because it's like salted (laughs) caramel popcorn. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I'm pulling your leg. (laughs) Yeah. Um, You... We've talked a little bit about some um, maybe sort of difficult diets and, and ladies on or specific ways of eating. But another thing you do address in your book is um, the vegetarian diet. And so I'm sure that's going to be quite prevalent to either mums who are vegetarian or even potentially vegan. Um, so yeah. How do you help mums like that? Because in a way, I can imagine a, a vegan mum particularly might say um, that she's eating real foods because she's eating real vegetables. but um, do they do they also end up supplementing with a lot more carbohydrates i'm not i I don't know how it works yeah so vegetarian diets tend to naturally be higher in carbohydrates just by default because all of your protein sources also contain carbohydrates so say you're a vegetarian that eats dairy and eggs so lacto ovo vegetarian Uh, almost all the dairy products minus butter and cheese um, and cream have a significant amount of carbohydrates. So like there's your protein, there's your carbs with it. You go to legumes like beans and lentils. Those have protein. They also have a lot of carbohydrates. Um, Even nuts and seeds, they have a lesser proportion of carbohydrates, but still like everything comes with more carbohydrates. So when you're trying to just meet the protein needs without going super, super high on 
carbohydrates, that's kind of hard to do without doing like a, a pure protein supplement or whatever. Um, the bigger issue for me though, than like total protein is the issue of the balance of the amino acids. Um, and I talk about this in the book. I know it's going to end up being controversial, which is why, well, you've read through it. So I just like cite everything (laughs) because if you want to go read the primary research, read it. I'm not making this stuff up. Um, but there's an amino acid called glycine that's needed in higher amounts, um, in the body during pregnancy. And that's really important for connective tissues. So you think of connective tissues kind of includes like joints and developing bones. So the whole skeleton developing bones, the organs, the blood vessel circulatory system in the baby, the skin, your growing uterus, your stretching skin, it's required for a lot. Um, And it's also involved in like all sorts of methylation um, reactions in the body. So, you know, the things that we typically think of being related to folate, glycine actually plays a role in the folate um, cycle in our metabolism. So there's a lot of needs for glycine and glycine is mostly found in connective tissue, skin and bones of animal foods, exactly where you find it in the human body, right? So if you're only eating vegetarian sources of protein, even if you're a lacto-ovo vegetarian, you have dairy and egg protein coming in. Those are not high glycine. Like I said, it's like bone, skin, and connective tissue. You can end up deficient in that nutrient. And that can be a risk factor for things like high blood pressure and high blood sugar. Um, it could be you know, an issue with the connective tissue development. It could be impaired methylation, which is involved in uh, you know, preventing certain birth defects. It's It can be serious. So I, for a variety of reasons, I'm picking one thing, I'm picking the glycine, but I go through all the different nutrients that can be missing on a vegetarian diet. Um, it can be challenging to meet your nutrient needs. I, I cannot ethically endorse, and it's ironic that I use the word ethically, but I cannot ethically endorse a vegan diet for pregnant women, even with supplementation. It just pales in comparison to what you can get from real food. And I think there's a reason that traditional cultures especially prized certain animal foods during pregnancy that were incredibly nutrient dense and rich in the very nutrients that we know are required for for proper fetal development but um yeah when i tackled that in the book i was like oh i'll just somebody asked me like are you going to cover this are you going to cover this and i was like oh, I, I don't want to go there i just don't even it's like too big of a rabbit hole and then i was like i realized okay i have to and it turned into this I don't know how many pages, 12, 13 page monster. It should probably be in its own chapter. It's just, there's a lot to consider. Yeah. Well, you know, it's anything to do with diet becomes emotional. And so, um, yeah, when you, and, and that, yeah, I've, I get it. Um, I've, you know, I've got a, a YouTube channel and your episode will be on there and, Sure. Some of the comments I get sometimes from people, it's, it mind blows me. So it gets so angry just yeah. because of how people eat. But I like yeah. it that you address that. So Yeah, I try to keep, you know, emotions out of it and just keep it based on the facts. Like mm. what nutrients are missing from this way of eating and how does how do deficiencies in these nutrients affect fetal development or or even like postpartum healing and, and breast milk. So there's actually quite a few case studies in the literature on severe vitamin B12 deficiencies among infants of exclusive, exclusively breastfed infants of mothers who are following a vegan or vegetarian diet. And that can actually have permanent neurological, do permanent, permanent neurological damage to the child. Some of it is irreversible. And that's serious to me because that's telling us like, even if you can get away with a vegan diet and bring a child to the world, what happens when they're reliant on you and your nutrient stores from your milk? If you're choosing to breastfeed, I mean, if your milk is deficient in these nutrients and your baby is, you know, I quote a case study in there of like a, you know, a six month old who's suddenly like between four and seven months, you tend to use up the B12 um, stores that you had in your body from birth. So the baby becomes even more reliant on a mother's milk. But if a mother is deficient, her milk is deficient 
And then the baby ends up getting a deficiency. And this this uh, one case report I talk about, this baby like lost the ability to even roll over, um, maintain eye contact, all these things. And within like a day or two of starting the baby on vitamin B12 supplement, um, she was able to regain those functions. And that was a lucky case because I think it's something like 40 to 50% of these cases are irreversible neurological mm. problems. Mm. So that's what's scary to me is it's like, you know, you can make you can make a choice for your own health, but to be making such a big choice for something that could impact your child's health for the rest of their life, that's a big de- decision to make. And I think it really has to be um, much more seriously considered because our our conventional guidelines just say our conventional guidelines say that a properly you know, developed vegan or vegetarian diet are, are fine during pregnancy. And I found a lot of evidence showing the contrary. So. So anyone who wants a nice controversial so read, <laughs> read that book. Read the book, send me the hate mail. It's okay. <laughs> I can, I can handle it. Um, so you, the, just to end off with our, our section, cause it, there's so much we can talk about with your book, but I did want to bring up um, now the mothers had the baby and particularly breast milk here. So um, with a real food diet that you talk about, do you also think um, that changes the the quality of the breast milk in any way? It does. This is another, con- you're asking the good controversial questions. <laughs> it does. It does change the um, breast milk. And that is kind of contrary to every message that we as women get. And I say this as a, as a mother who's still currently breastfeeding a a kiddo. Um, yeah, your diet quality does impact the nutrient levels in, in your breast milk. There are certain things that stay stationary, um, certain nutrients that don't change much, but there are quite a few nutrients that are reflected by what a mom eats. So like the quality of, of fat that a mother eats reflects what fat is transferred into the breast milk. Um, B12 is an example I already gave. The amount of B12 influences B12 in the breast milk. Vitamin A, I'd have to pull up, I'll pull up the chapter so I can name them all off because it's kind of a long list of things. Um, Again, this was something that I was like, I don't know if I want to cover because there's so, it's so hard to encourage, but like our breastfeeding rates in the U.S. are just abysmal super super low there are a million barriers to breastfeeding and so the last thing you want to do is have a mother question that her milk is good enough for her baby so your milk is good enough for your baby Mm -hmm. you can make your milk even higher in nutrition if you focus on really good quality foods and that's the main point that i want to get across is that i'm not discouraging women from pregnant from breastfeeding i'm encouraging women to breastfeed and take care of themselves and produce, you know, higher nutrient breast milk by eating better quality food. Because you also have to recover from pregnancy and birth, and it's a long haul to recover, and you need those nutrients. So um, the ones that are most most commonly affected by um, a mother's diet in her breast milk, it's vitamin B1, B2, B3, B6, B12, vitamins A, D, K, choline, fatty acids like DHA, and then also problematic fatty acids like trans fats also transfer into the breast milk and then um, certain trace minerals like selenium and iodine are also affected so it's a huge range Mm. so the best you can do is you know all all the foods that i outline in the book as being important for pregnancy those are the same foods that are important for maintaining your nutritional status while while you're nursing and while you're recovering from pregnancy and birth and those are the very same ones that that help um you know, influence the the nutrients in your breast milk. And one of the things I point out, you know, in that section is traditional cultures had like a very strong emphasis on postpartum recovery. And a mother was in, you go all across the globe and there's this magical, like 40 days, six week ish, um, at least a month time period where a woman is a new mother is mothered for a period of time. There's family members that come in, prepare your food. Your only job is to like sit on the couch and nurse and sleep. That's it. Recover. All you do is recover. And we do not do that in our culture whatsoever. And so what do we end up with? We end up with super 
exhausted, nutrient depleted mothers trying to hold it all together, you know, without maternity leave, having to go back to work right away. It just creates this carryover effect of health problems that can follow you around for a long time. So um, I just, I had to put it in the book. I think I told you before we started recording, I've, I've had some complaints from advanced reviewers that I like get off track from talking about nutrition, but I'm like, no, 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 it's all related. Like it's all part of the story. It's like, we can't fix everything with food. Because sometimes you need, you know, peer support. Sometimes you need exercise. Sometimes you need to pay attention to the toxins that are in your food or personal care products. You know, we need to be considering sort of a, a broader thing than just food. And the biggest one for postpartum is, is support really. Mm -hmm. And that, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to bring it up to that. If anyone reads your book, that it isn't just about food. It's, it is a guy, it's, it's like a handbook for a pregnant mom. And also even after she's had the baby, um, and I love it that you do address other stresses in life. So food is one source of stress on on the body, you know, it, a good stress, bad stress. But as you've mentioned, you know, you talk about environmental toxins and just simple things to be aware of and stress management and how a mum should move and exercise and take care of themselves. Yeah, it's great that you look at the holistic picture there um, on, yeah. on how. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think it's a, uh, you did a good thing there. So you got a, a, a star rating from me on that one. <laughs> um, so I guess again I just everyone listening I, there's so many things we could talk about but I couldn't address everything in this hour but um, how can people keep following you uh, Lily or keep in contact what, what kind of uh, links and resources can we link to for you yeah you can um, find me on my main website which is pilatesnutritionist.com and anything related to uh, this new book that I'm putting out, uh, Real Food for Pregnancy, which I think will be published by the time this goes live, um, you'll see it at realfoodforpregnancy.com. Anything related to gestational diabetes, looking at the book, I also have an online program for women who are, were just diagnosed, that's at realfoodforgd.com. Okay, great. And then the usual social media channels, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, so... Great. Well, I'll link to all of that in your show notes on your episode page and... Um so everyone can follow you but i just want to say thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge bombs and even uh going with my flow with some of my side questions oh i love it i love the on the fly side questions so i'm all out <laughs> right well thanks lily yeah appreciate it <laughs>